So, um, and really my goal here is to try and do a little bit of what Javier was saying at the end there. So this is a much broader struggle than just our sp very specific digital rights. So I work, so the New Economics Foundation, for those that don't know, we're a, we're a think tank based here in the UK. Uh, our strap line, if you need one, and everyone kind of needs one in the 21st century, is rethinking economics as if people and the planet mattered. So we try and recenter it on the idea of people, community, and especially the environment. Um, so I have uh, been working on kind of issues of digital trade. It's quite new to me. I lead the kind of the digital economy team at the New Economics Foundation, which has been going for about a couple of years. Um, also have a past history, if you go a long way back as a lawyer, so understanding a little bit of kind of these international treaties and legislation. Um, and so I'm going to try and do three things, uh, or just two things really, is one, tell a few stories about how digital trade is going to impact beyond some of the issues that Javier and Mike have been talking about. Uh, agriculture, something that doesn't necessarily spring to mind as kind of a digital native thing. Some really important things around uh, enforcing our local laws, uh, going into a bit more detail around algorithmic accountability, which I think is just going to be um, so crucial. But um, I think I'll start with one of the kind of the biggest learnings I've had in my journey into thinking about trade, which is in some ways they're kind of setting up a rule framework. You know, they look a bit like rules. They're kind of text, uh, provision, section 1B, 7, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but what they are in fact much more like is kind of anti-rules. They are things that prevent and that set in place a specific framework or that freeze a specific regulatory environment and prohibit or at least make it extremely difficult for states to take action. And I think that's really, really different to how we conceive of normal lawmaking uh, and rulemaking in and of itself. And I think uh, hopefully as I go through some of the examples, uh, it will show why these kind of anti-rules are so dangerous and ultimately so undemocratic. Um, and again, my organization didn't take a, uh, a public position on whether we're for or against Brexit. But if part of the narrative was to regain some control, uh, the kinds of things that we're signing up to or that we will be forced to sign up to as part of trade agreements are the absolute opposite. The EU definitely had a democratic deficit in some regard, although it was definitely improving over time. The parliament, which is the only democratic part, was getting more power. Uh, but what we're dealing with in terms of signing up to free trade agreements is the absolute opposite. Whereas the EU had the Court of Justice, which um, obviously Mike spoke about. Uh, when it comes to free trade agreements, we have either WTO courts, uh, which are one way of doing it, but mainly we have these other things called investor state dispute settlement uh, schemes, or ISDS for short. And this is where basically companies sue countries for regulations that they've put in place. Uh, an interesting current example that has a kind of digital flavor, it's not fully due to a digital chapter being signed in a free trade agreement, but uh, Uber has just taken the government of Colombia uh, to court through one of these ISDS processes for banning Uber uh, in Colombia. Uh, so these are the kind of things we're going to see a lot more of. Hugely anti-democratic, these courts. So the, uh, they're generally two judges who are nominated by the country and one judge who's nominated by the defendant. And so you can see easily how those decisions go. And, and many decisions are extremely costly for the countries that try and go against these decisions. And again, as with all legal action, often the threat of legal action is enough uh, to stop the behavior. And so uh, uh, it will be interesting to see uh, whether Colombia persists in trying to uh, keep Uber out of its market or relents uh, just for fear of um, uh, falling foul. Um, I do, I'm just gonna set a quick timer for myself. So, because uh, with, as with all of these things, the most interesting things come from the questions and not from the speakers. And so uh, I wanna try and not take up all the time before the end of the day. Um, so I'm just gonna go through a couple of examples to try and bring into reality some of the uh, detail that Javier and Mike were saying. So um, one of the things that also is contained in kind of the digital chapters and especially something that's being pushed by the EU is the idea that a uh, company that provides a digital service won't necessarily need a legal entity based in the country where they're providing that service. 
And again, if you're thinking of a large multinational company, if you're thinking that you want to provide services all over the place, a bit like the data localization story that Javier was saying, it's a real hassle if you need to like uh, have an office in everywhere, register, there's tax obligations, uh, the, the jurisdictions are always different. Uh, and so obviously, again, this is a thing that uh, is something that the big, large platform companies uh, are really interested in. Um, and again, it seems to make sense if we want to if we want to really encourage that digital trade and we want to encourage those big players to come, then, well, maybe we should allow them to come without having a legal presence. But that has huge problems when you think about how we're going to enforce some of the things that are most important to us, like our local laws, be it either labor laws, be it health and safety. Uh, these, uh, these things are important. And without a legal entity based in the country, uh, they become very, very hard to uh, enforce. Um, I'm already seeing real-world examples of this. Um, one that's particularly um, uh, interesting, I find, is, uh, uh, and it's a, a, a not a local example, but so Alibaba, so the uh, kind of China's Amazon, although uh, its ambitions and reach are far bigger than Amazon's, uh, and uh, so they have recently got into the fresh food delivery business, just as Amazon has been trying to do. Um, and just as Amazon is buying real infrastructure, real places, so Whole Foods now, which they own, or, but you can equally get it delivered straight through the platform, uh, Alibaba are also expanding their portfolio of services that they want to offer into real food. And so they have bought a whole bunch of land and farms in New Zealand, uh, where they are then uh, producing milk. They're then taking that milk and shipping it all across Southeast Asia. Uh, and again, so what happens? Who is ultimately responsible for that milk that is delivered? And, and these digital regulations are about making it difficult, again, to make people accountable, to remove the accountability of these large platforms so that it's, it's all about facilitating trade. It's all about allowing these big platforms to operate. And again, undermining the power of local regulation, the power of us as people, as democracies, to kind of set the standards and to hold those companies account that wish to uh, participate. Um, similarly, this is happening on work platforms as well. There are many work platforms where you can uh, work, uh, you can engage in, uh, like for instance, tutoring or things like that. Uh, I can engage that service again with no legal presence here, uh, even though the tutor may be here and I may be here. Uh, who's going to enforce the, 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 the labor laws for that particular tutor? And again, it becomes very complicated when there are no uh, legal entities uh, around. So um, again, it just shows how something that sounds technical and that sounds very much just about something very, very data, in fact, spills out into just the way we kind of govern society and the rules that we want to, uh, the rules that we, that we decide collectively are important. Um, I also want to talk about algorithmic accountability. I know Javier mentioned it and talked about it a little bit, but um, I think for me it's so important that uh, I think it just bears talking a little bit through a little bit more. Um, so, you know, algorithms are really entering every single part of our life. Uh, no longer are they just kind of sorting the information of the internet out for us, uh, deciding which search preferences to show us first, uh, for Amazon to decide which book, you know, we might like to read next. Although those are really important kind of economic factors, and uh, the fact that Google is being sued by a, another compare the, you know another shopping uh, service for downgrading their search to the fifth page, which basically put them out of business. So these are important economic decisions, but maybe not important decisions for us as individuals. But going forward, and already today, if you apply for a job at anything like a medium or a large company, your CV is first of all going to be read by an algorithm. You're only going to make it to the next stage if you pass that algorithm's test. Uh, all the police forces, uh, and I've met the guys that have designed it for the, for the Metropolitan Police here, are using algorithms to try and predict where crime is going to happen so that they can target their workforces uh, to those places where they think crime is going to happen. Um, <coughs> if you're up for parole, uh, your chart, your uh, risk of recidivism is going to be generated by an algorithm that's going to provide a number to a judge, which is going to then inform whether you get parole or go back to prison. Uh, and indeed, one of the scarier ones, so I live in Hackney, just, uh, oh, are we still in Hackney here? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think maybe just. Um, uh, the council there experimented with an algorithm that would have uh, tried to predict the likelihood 
So if you had a if you had a child in Hackney, they would put you, the parents, and the kind of the entourage of the child into an algorithm to try and predict the risk of that child being subject to child abuse uh, in the first years. So these algorithms are really no longer just technically sorting data; they're making real world decisions about us. And uh, if I was subject to a decision either by my job, uh, important decisions about whether I go to prison or not, important decisions about whether the police are overbearing in my community, or whether my child is uh, going to be put on kind of an at-risk register, I want to know that these algorithms are at least unbiased or uh, are explicit in their biases so that we can act accordingly. And again, algorithms, as I'm sure most, a lot of the people in this room know, learn from past data. And this can be extremely troubling in many of the areas they're in fact being used. So in police, they perpetuate. Uh, so where crime is recorded, it is not an accurate reflection of where crime occurs. And so if we just use past data of where crime occurs, uh, we will absolutely not be, we will just be reinforcing some of that prejudice uh, and some of that racism that goes into uh, policing uh, to begin with. Um, so it's really important that we, as civil society, uh, retain a possibility to get access to this source code. And these are actually the main things that uh, the treaties are trying to uh, stop us from. The treaties, although the free trade agreements, although they started uh, making kind of no exceptions for when source code could be shown, over time, uh, the interests of big tech have actually kind of been integrated into the text here. So, uh, for instance, now it can be shown in IP disputes, so in intellectual property disputes, because actually that's something that large multinationals engage in. And there's an understanding that this is beneficial and that they need in their disputes with other tech companies to be able to show it around, uh, you know, in cases of IP. Um, competition law, again, this is something that's engaged in by the big companies, often against big companies or against small companies. Um, uh, but, uh, or even the, the latest US tax with the US, Canada, um, Mexico, so the new NAFTA, which again puts, uh, a, 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 you are allowed to kind of disclose source code in very specific legal cases. Um, but that's far from what we want as uh, a civil society organization. We really need to understand that these algorithms being perpetrated out into our, into our country uh, at really important areas, uh, that we can know that they're functioning as, at least as stated, uh, as a bare minimum, and ha then have some control to influence what and how these algorithms um, should work. And of course, industry would like us to think that voluntary measures are going to be OK here. Uh, don't worry, like, you know, uh, some companies are even saying, you know, we can provide a kind of algorithmic audit. Um, the likes of Ernst & Young and the accounting firms are all over it. Uh, but let's think about what happened in around financial data. Uh, so that is also a kind of voluntary process where the companies make open up their books to these accounting firms to supposedly validate uh, the financial uh, accounts of these companies. But let's just remember that months before Lehman Brothers went bust in 2008, their accountants gave them a completely clean bill of health. Uh, months before Enron collapsed in a world of mess, the accountants gave it a clean bill of health. We cannot rely on these voluntary measures to uh, enforce something that I think is even more important than financial data, uh, which is that the algorithms are working as, um, as we say. Um, I'm just going to cover one more example and then go into some of the complexities of the trade agreements and uh, the, the difficult position that the UK is in, trying to negotiate both with the US and the UK from basically a position of real weakness. Um, but the last one is, I think, is, is agriculture. So again, Javier kind of alluded to, whereas you know, the picture that I still have in my head of agriculture is a kind of non-tech world a person and their field, uh, tending animals, growing vegetables. Uh, now, obviously, that's far from the reality today. And in fact, farming's moved on a lot. Uh, there are now farms which, in fact, have no people at all. Uh, so there's a farm in Vietnam that grows salads, controlled by a bunch of people in Japan. Literally, there's no people. Uh, and it grows salads, hugely expensive salads, but there's a market for anything if you can, uh, if you can create it. But 
But more of a problem is that, um, so digital technology, um, uh, through kind of, uh, uh, that allows people to kind of make their own proteins and enzymes is allowing a new form of kind of biopiracy. If we saw in the 90s and 2000s, people trying to kind of go patent mad and patent kind of indigenous strains and plants, uh, what's happening now is kind of a little bit different, is that they're going away, they're analyzing it, uh, these proteins, these enzymes, which are going to kind of be the future of food, and you may or may not like buy into the whole factory meat and but it's, un, un, it's, it's undoubtable this is really big business, and this is at least where the, uh, a lot of industry is going. Um, and so they're converting these things into these, these, these living organisms into data, uh, shipping them across the world, and rebuilding them through, these, through, through digital technology, uh, and then patenting them. So you're taking a common asset something that shouldn't really be the subject of any intellectual property uh, and is being privatized uh, and enclosed by big tech companies. Um, and again, the free trade agreements didn't cause this problem, but what free trade agreements will do if they're signed is make it very, very difficult to rectify the problem. So if a company, if a country cannot uh, forbid the free flow of certain forms of data, which is exactly what Javier was talking about, how are they going to prevent some of this really valuable national, uh, this really valuable Im important information leaving their country? Similarly, if they can't force uh, companies to localize and produce some of the goods uh, in country, uh, again, how are they going to reap the benefits when they are either not technically capable or just don't haven't uh, made those particular kinds of uh, developments yet? Um, also in a world of um, kind of climate change and uh, we're moving very much into an area of a kind of smart and precision agriculture, whereas Javier said, you now a field is sens a map of sensors often combined with drones to help people understand exactly where disease is most likely, where uh, rather than, and again, these are hugely beneficial in some sense, uh, really reduce the amount of water you need to place in your crops because you can target it much more effectively. Uh, reduce the amounts of pesticides and herbicides because, again, you can target them much more efficiently. Um, but this technology comes at a cost, uh, and this technology is not developable by just anybody. These are going to be developed by either the same companies that led the kind of the GM revolution, uh, which is an ever consolidating smaller market of companies, uh, again, which don't have either farmers' interests at heart, uh, certainly not climate change, and certainly not kind of soil health. Um, but there's also a whole bunch of new entrants, the likes of Amazon and Fujitsu and others uh, getting into this kind of world um, really quickly. Um, and again, this isn't a problem that digital trade created, but again, this is a problem that digital trade will make harder to solve. Uh, in the past, uh, it, we engaged in ideas of technology transfer uh, around uh, ideas like this. And so as a condition of entry, the providers of technology would share it with local countries so that ultimately people could stand up on their own two feet. And this wasn't, isn't just something that happened in developing countries. Uh, so when Norway discovered oil in the late 70s, they had no capabilities or capacity to get the oil out of the country, to get the oil out of the ground. Um, and so when they allowed people in to start, ex start extracting the oil, they did it on the proviso that, over t that they would share the technical knowledge with them. And over time, Norway has become a world leader in technology to extract oil and gas from the ground. Um, so this isn't just something that we should do benevolently to poorer countries. Um, this, is, this, is, this is real stuff that we should absolutely be sharing this knowledge. We should absolutely be building up people's capacity um, to uh, do this. Um, and then finally, on just on the national, you know, data nationalization aspect, and again, working on, I work with a lot of groups, you know, based out of India and others where this argument is probably the most developed and, uh, uh, you know, they see information around what seeds work, local knowledge, climate, all of that's important, you know, key strategic nationally important data. Um, and I think there's strong arguments for really questioning why we should just allow that to flow, free, fro, flow freely um, to those um, best able to exploit it. Um, 
And so again, this idea that uh, that, that uh, the free trade agreements, again, they don't create the problem, but they make it very, very hard for countries to do anything about it because you cannot place limits. And again, as Javier mentioned, as the world, as everything becomes digital, um, you're going to see these problems um, uh, evaporate, uh, kind of extend into many, many other areas. Um, I'll just finish with two minutes because I've already waffled on for way too long, so uh, apologies for that. But um, I just want to talk quickly about like, the, the complex position that the UK finds itself in. So the UK, uh, under this government, has basically made a commitment that it's going to sign two trade agreements in the next 12 months. Um, so the EU, it's committed to do it by the end of the year, um, and the US uh, in a kind of similar time frame. And as Javier said, they're not starting from scratch. You know, from what we understand, they might be as much as 80% kind of agreed on at least a lot of the core topics. Um, but the UK has kind of made some really, uh, and again, what's, what's different about thinking about these things in a trade environment versus when, for instance, we all spent time discussing when the GDPR was coming in uh, and we were trying to discuss specific issues uh, and we were trading off various items within the data protection world against each other and trying to understand what the best formulation of data protection. You know, as Javier you know, mentioned, data, data and data protection and the, and the kind of the data environment just is just one bargaining chip amongst others that trade negotiators will kind of flip around uh, uh, with no real kind of understanding of its importance. And I think a really important thing is that whereas We've heard uh, the UK government say specifically the NHS is off the table, um, that uh, you know, we won't be lowering our agricultural standards, that we won't be allowing those damn chlorinated chickens into our, into our, into our country. We're not going to be lowering our environmental standards. Um, and similarly, towards the EU, they've been you know, uh, confidently saying, oh, we're not going to have regulatory alignment with you. Uh, so we're not going to maintain the same kind of regulatory uh, framework as you, but uh, we're definitely going to get an adequacy decision around data, as Javier was saying, uh, and almost more importantly for a place like London, uh, we're going to get financial passporting, which again, which allows basically a financial company to register in the UK and operate freely across uh, all of Europe. Um, and again, that requires our financial regulations to stay the same. So. The UK has been basically putting out all of these contradictory messages, things that don't tally up. And, and, and Javier talks really eloquently about like, the difficulty of the adequacy decision. We're going to have an, an appropriate data protection framework with the EU, which makes us adequate. And yet we're also going to have a free flow of data with the US uh, to keep the US um, I'm happy. Um, and so uh, the, the one clear thing is that if you want to sign a trade agreement fast, you have to concede to all the demands of the other side. Uh, that's why it took the EU seven plus years to negotiate a trade deal with Canada. That's why these things take a huge amount of time. And Canada is, again, a very progressive country. From an EU perspective, this should have probably been one of the easiest deals uh, to sign. It takes a huge amount of effort. Um, and so. Again, if the EU has, the, the UK has a kind of choice. So either we will conform to the timeline that the government has set out, but that will mean conceding to the US uh, things like the NHS. And again, the NHS argument, I think, can be a bit deceptive because it's not about necessarily US companies coming over here and running our hospitals. I don't think that's necessarily what they're really after. And the, and the trade agreement text, uh, you kind of says that. What they're much more interested in is extending IP patents and really getting access to this NHS data trove. Nowhere else in the world do you have such an integrated health service where you have so many millions of people's records from birth to death uh, across all forms of care. This data is hugely valuable and we shouldn't, uh, we shouldn't forget about it. So yeah, so uh, I'll just finish with this idea that yes, if we, if we want to do trade and the government's under huge pressure to show that the government is kind of that the Great Britain is open for business in a post-Brexit environment, that it wasn't about isolating ourselves away from the world. Uh, and free trade agreements are a really visible way of saying, hey, look, we're still here on the global stage. Um, but the only way we're going to get this through by the end of the year is basically by capitulating to all the demands. And then where are we in terms of 
the notion of that we've regained any control or any sovereignty over ourselves. We've just, the bit that we did regain, we threw it away within 12 months. And so um, what's the point of that? So I think I will end there because I'm really sorry for talking so long, but really looking forward to questions. Thank you.